Uh, okay, no slides. Here we go. Hi. When when do I start? Okay. Uh, so I am the developer of Bundler. I started a nonprofit called Ruby Together, whose T-shirt I am wearing. Thank you. Uh, the good news is. We successfully served gems this year. Uh, in the first 10 years of Ruby Gems, we served 2 billion gems. Last year, we served 4 billion gems. This year, we've already served 4 billion gems, and we still have almost two months left in the year. Uh, as you can probably guess, that is hard, and it costs money now because there's a lot of work to do that's really hard. Uh, if your company doesn't chip back into Ruby together to make us able to afford the servers and the developers that make this possible, it won't be possible. Please do that. Uh, in exciting news, I have stickers. Come get stickers. And now that we're all excited, uh, Ruby together is launching a merch store. You can now buy cool swag. Awesome. Thanks. All right, this is going to be super quick. I uh, just wanted to let you know I did something at my company. Uh, I'm a DevOps working at Lightspeed back in Montreal. Um, we were organizing tech talks for a while, and we had some success with it, but it really took off when we actually invited sales, support, legal, and those people to come down and talk to the developers to tell them what they thought about the products, what they liked, disliked, what they wanted to see, and allow the developers... <sighs> I have allow the developers uh, to be able to ask them questions and understand what the impact of what they do actually is. So I strongly encourage all of you to do the same in your orgs. Hi, everyone. Sam uh, got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Can we switch slides on, please? Thank you. This is uh, transformation. I used to look like this. and Like a day ago. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't. Um, so. I want to talk about a long time ago when I was not a maintainer of a popular Ruby gem and how wonderful <laughs> I thought it might be. How, how I would learn to write perfect, perfect code and uh, get the unending adoration of my peers, uh, work with people who mostly agree with me all the time. That, that would be great. But the truth is it's not really like that. Um, open source software looks radically different to every and all Rails or other Ruby applications that you worked on. And just by nature of the work, some of the code is definitely less than perfect. To go back to that thing that I just showed, this is RSpec mox proxy message received. If you use RSpec, you execute this hundreds of times a day, and I honestly cannot tell you everything that this method does. That's not to say that the people who wrote it are bad people. That's not to say that they're not spending enough time on their projects or under not enough stress. These are incredibly talented people who are diligent and just don't have enough time to do everything that they want to do. I think time is one of the most precious resources our maintainers have. This number scares the hell out of me every time I see it. Um, that means I'm serving all of you and many beyond who need the help writing their tests, and I think a lot of other maintainers feel the same way. Our ecosystem is driven by open source. Literally everybody in this room is here because of an open source programming language that Matt's created. And the thing is, like, we have to talk about sustainability in our community. Our maintainers are one of our most important resources. And in the past few years, I felt a little bit like the ones I looked up to a long time ago before I was working on open source are beginning to fade away. And this is not true of all of them. Some of them are having life priorities change. You know, some people are having kids. Some people have moved on to other programming languages and communities that they find really interesting and new and exciting. And some of them, well, just straight up aren't with us anymore. So Ruby isn't cool anymore. I think Matt's basically said this in his opening keynote. We've moved to a place of maturity. But I think one thing that does for us is it means that maintainers aren't coming in with the same excited fervor 
that they used to be. And we have a rich ecosystem. We have a room full of open source contributors, and you're all amazing. But continuity of work is going to be necessary for these large projects. We can't just have one-off contributions. We need more regular committers. So if you can, please help. But it would be disingenuous for me to tell you that it's easy or that it's always rewarding. But the reason I am here and the reason that I work on an open source Ruby project is that I love this room, I love this community, and I love all of the work that I do within it. And if you want more exposure to more amazing people, then maybe think about finding an open source project and finding some time to contribute it to it today. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Caroline Job, and I'm very excited and thankful to be here as an Opportunity Scholar at my first RubyConf. Thanks. I started learning Ruby about six months ago, but I've been throwing parties for a lot longer. So I'm here to talk to you about how to throw a party the Ruby way. Imagine this. You're sitting at home and you're about to eat a delicious hamburger when you hear a knock on the door. You answer it to find 10 of your closest friends have arrived for a dinner party about which you had completely forgotten. <laughs> Don't panic. Take the hamburger into the kitchen and start chopping. <laughs> Soon you'll have ham. Problem solved. Now some of your health conscious friends want smoothies with the ham. And you've got fruit, but is it frozen? No. You don't have a blender or a freezer, but Ruby can handle this. Obviously they're blended now. But are they frozen? Yes. <laughs> now not everyone came to your party to drink smoothies. Some of your friends are running low on drinks. We've got an empty glass, a half-empty glass, and your optimistic friend with a half-full glass. Just use Ruby to fill all of those glasses at once. <laughs> Ruby has saved the party again. All good parties end with piles of dirty dishes. But with Ruby, cleaning up is as simple as dirty dishes dot clear. That was sure easy. Now this is great, but I want to issue a few words of caution. Let's say you're about to eat a banana split, and your best friend shows up and asks you to share. Be careful. It might seem like a good idea to split a banana split, but will it end up like this? Let's try it. Unfortunately, as you may have suspected, splitting a banana split will just leave you with the banana while your friend splits. <laughs> this is a bitter melon indigenous to Asia, and your health conscious friends are back. And they want you to make them bitter melon juice, which is all the new rage. It should be easy, they say. Just squeeze it, right? But does bitter melon dot squeeze actually give us bitter melon juice? Thanks. It does not. Bitter melon dot squeeze actually makes biter melon, <laughs> which I imagine looks something like this. Hopefully, this has been useful. But just in case, I want to leave you with one practical takeaway. And this is an old family recipe that's been passed down through generations for Ruby chicken. You simply pluck the feathers, scrub it, insert the stuffing, or split and flatten it, pop it in the oven, rotate it halfway through cooking, inspect it for doneness, let the temperature slightly drop while you set the table, then slice it and join together to chomp on some Ruby chicken and enjoy each bite. I'm Caroline Job. If anyone has any other ways they like to use Ruby to throw a party, go ahead and tweet me at Caroline underscore Job. And thanks so much. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Jen, and I'm here to talk about accessibility issues um, with your app. And what I'm talking about are m making sure your app is useful for people who may be hearing impaired, visually impaired, colorblind, um, motor functions. There's a whole host of issues and reasons uh, and use cases we might want to address. So that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, so why do we want to make this accessible? Well, we like to have sites that are functional and usable. Um, and we want our users to be happy. We want them to be able to use those functional and usable sites. <laughs> also, sometimes it's the law. Um, so <laughs> that's important, too. Uh, if you work on a federal project like I do, you're very familiar with this. Um, uh, there's lots of ways that we can uh, improve our apps. And some of the, I'm going to take you through some of the ways you can do that. First of all, test your app. Um, and I'm not talking about like write a test, I'm talking about actually open it and go through it. Uh, the first thing you want to check for is a keyboard trap. And essentially what this is, is you only use the keyboard to run through your app, make sure links work, make sure you can complete forms. Um, if you're going through your app and suddenly you can't do anything, that's a trap. Um, the second thing I want to talk about, oh well, first of all, how to solve that. There are lots of ways to solve it. I recommend Stack Overflow. <laughs> <laughs> Second, loss of focus. This is an issue where, uh, you know that little gray bar you see around buttons on uh, like Google? Uh, that's a default browser behavior usually. Don't get rid of those. Um, that's actually an visual, important visual cue for users to know where they're at within your application. So try to keep that around and don't listen to your designers all the time. Um, there are some great tools out there for testing, and usually these focus on things that make it either uh, visual impairment aware or uh, accessible to screen readers. Um, the one I use is the Wave Chrome extension. There's lots of them out there. I like this one. Uh, the first thing you want to look for are contrast issues. So if you do have someone who's colorblind or co like visually impaired, uh, you want to make sure that you're hitting a color ratio for your text. Typically a passing ratio for compliance is about 4.5 to 1. Um, basically, you want to make sure that your text is readable uh, on the slides, or on, pff, on the <laughs> website. Uh, some other things that are pretty common whenever you run a tool like this, uh, images need alt tags. You want to make sure that alt tags are really concise and that they're meaningful. They actually describe what an image is supposed to be doing. So if you're using an image for a link, make sure it says clicking here does this. And I've included a little reference down here. Um, Forms, so labels. You have a, a place where you want a, a user to enter like their first name. Uh, you, it'll say first name and then enter your first name here. So you want to make sure that that label has a for tag that matches the ID of your input. Um, this is like the number one thing we get dinged on in my project, so that's why I included it. Um, other form elements uh, also like select or drop down boxes, um, those also need something to make the screen reader be able to read them. Uh, and what I use here is a title. There's lots of different things you can use, though, for screen readers to read this. Uh, so definitely recommend looking into those options. Um, oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, hi, good evening everybody. My name is Star Chen. Um, I work at Excella Consulting. We are hiring right now. I'm looking for karaoke buddies. Um, but today I'm gonna be talking about Git and uh, situations where you might have Git shame. Um, so I've been developing for a little over a year now, but whether you've been developing for 10 years or uh, 10 weeks or 10 minutes, um, I think you might have the anxiety of uh, having a situation where you do something in Git and your reaction is like this. Um, it feels very catastrophic. You don't know how you're going to fix it. Your whole team is going to know that you single-handedly messed everything up. Um, so we're just going to take a little step back and talk about a few, uh, in case of emergency, lifesavers to get you out of these situations. The first one is git ref log. Um, git ref log is going to be a log that shows you uh, all kinds of things that you were doing in git. It's different from git log because git log shows you uh, where your head was, um, and git ref log shows you what the head was referring to. Um, and so if you use this and you find the place where you maybe mess things up, you can do a git reset head to the uh, index of your git ref log because, again, you're not going to a specific commit, so you're not going to a commit ID. You're doing things in between as well. Um, so just remember to keep calm and use your git ref log. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have a lot of Git messages that look like this. Um, this is maybe if you are in a rush, you're a little careless, you just haven't been keeping to your best practices, you have typos in your uh, commit message or in your code itself, um, you forgot to check RuboCop, um, you didn't 
do things that you needed for testing. Uh, so what you do is first you just add your one or two character fix to staging. Um, then you do a git commit dash dash amend. Uh, this is going to be your best friend if you make a lot of typos um, because you can also edit your commit message itself, but it will add your tiny little change to the previous commit. It will amend that commit. Um, I don't know how often you guys are really eager beavers and you uh, do something really cool, you're working on a new feature and then you commit it straight to master uh, and you are terrified. Um, this is a pretty easy fix. First, you're just going to branch off of uh, master with your fresh awesome commit um, and then you're going to create a feature branch that looks exactly like master with your new commit uh, and then you're just going to delete that commit with a git reset hard. Um, and then check out your new branch, and then you're going to check your logs because you never believe that you've actually fixed the situation, but you did, you're going to be fine. Um, if you are uh, maybe testing a colleague's branch and you forget that you uh, were supposed to be working on your own branch after that, um, you can do a git reset soft, which then brings your changes back into staging. Um, and then you can stash them. Uh, so stashing, if you're not familiar, is also going to be your friend if you need to move changes from one branch to another. It kind of just like picks them up um, and you check out your correct branch and then you can uh, put them back down uh, with a git stash apply or a git stash pop. And from there, you can commit it to the correct branch. Now, sometimes you're trying to be fastidious and uh, you do a git diff to see uh, what changes you've made in this commit. Um, and then there's nothing there and it's very sad. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what happens is git diff does not show what's in uh, your staging area if you've already done a git add. Um, so you just have to add a really quick dash dash staged in order to see those changes. And you won't be a sad raccoon. Also, that raccoon got to eat some candy in the end, just so you all know. Um, if you are desperate to get your code working again, you've been trying all sorts of weird Git wizardry and nothing is coming together, um, and you just kind of want to blow up your whole repository, uh, you can do that as long as you've been really good about um, pushing to your remote repository uh, regularly. Um, so you just kind of, you, you just remove your whole repository essentially, um, and then you clone it back down. This can be uh, really cathartic and it feels really good. Um, and as long as you actually are being good about pushing to your remote repository, uh, this is not that bad. I know some folks who they just do this very, very regularly. Um, and that's a little scary, but I mean, it feels pretty good. If you like deleting code, you're going to love this. Um, so all of these tips I actually stole from uh, Pardon my language, ohshitgit.com. Um, this was written by uh, Katie Seiler Miller, who's an engineer at Etsy who likes swearing a lot more than I do. Um, but I have this page bookmarked in my browser because um, one of the, I was really scared of Git when I started developing. I knew that it was a way that I could mess up my work and other people's work. But um, Git becomes a lot less scary when you realize that uh, any mistakes you make are not permanent and can actually be very easily managed. Um, and so once you conquer Git, you feel a little bit invincible. Thanks for your time. Good evening, everyone. My name is Olivia Brundage. I'm going to talk to you today about how to automate your productivity through creating Ruby scripts and making them run daily. So just as a little backstory, in June, I got a new job as a software developer. Everything was going great, but I was really, really busy learning a lot of new stuff. Then my brilliant idea was to get a puppy in July. And let me tell you, taking care of a form Four-month-old puppy is a lot of work. So needless to say, I did not know where I'm going to get time. So I'm struggling around for these past few months, figuring out how am I going to get things done. Luckily, there's a productivity method called get things done. So I'm here getting her things done using OmniFocus uh, on my Mac to write down all the tasks that I need to get done. But one of the troubling things is my work issues me tasks that I need to do. I don't want to put those tasks into OmniFocus to get things done. I want that to be automatic. So I created a Ruby script just to make that happen. I'm going to walk you through the process of how you can automate some boring tasks. So just as a preface, this only pertains to really Mac OS and any other bash operating systems. And anything highlighted throughout the slide is things that you need to change. But it's really, really simple. So first off, you're going to create your Ruby script um, to automate your things and just store it somewhere where you're not going to mess with it. Then you're going to create your RVM alias and label it 
for your app. So this is a way that the Mac does not use its native Ruby language and uses the Ruby language that your app actually supports, which is very important. And then you're gonna create your bash file and your bash file just runs your Ruby script from your RVM alias. And the last important step is to create your launch daemon file and save it in your launch daemon um, library, which is located there. And this is what that file looks like. And notice really the only two things you need to change are those two highlighted things right there. And you really much have a automated script that runs for you. And that is it, it's really simple. Thank you all very much for your time. My name is Kate Rizenis and I'm a scholar here. And um, I'm gonna teach you, I'm gonna talk to you about self-learning. I'm not I'm gonna try not to bore you with my talk. Okay, there are two main keys to learning. One, you need the internet. That's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, you need the internet. And then um, also you need a mentor. This is where you come in. What are the good qualities of a mentor? You're probably wondering. Uh, they help you when you get stuck. That's pretty self-explanatory. Everybody needs help when they get stuck and then they don't touch the keyboard. This is very important. This is very important, okay? Because when they touch the keyboard, you don't know, like, they don't know how the syntax goes, especially if you write copy scripts. If the spaces get wrong, like, your whole text is messed up, so don't touch the keyboard. Um, good mentors will check on you constantly because programmers, especially new programmers, don't want to be burdens on anybody. They want to be able to like, be independent. And they explain the misconcepts. Um, when you're a mentor, you also want to say, I don't know, because this lets the student know that it's OK not to know that they don't know something. OK, how do you become a mentor? This is a pretty good question, too. First, you find someone who needs help. Second, you make an offer of the help. A uh, good way to find someone who needs help um, at this, at this uh, conference, we have scholars, for one. You could offer a scholar to be their mentor. Even seniors need help mentoring. My mom, she's a senior dev, and last, last, no, it was this year in May, she went to RailsConf, and she met a guy named Jig, and he's her mentor. They meet every other week. So no matter what level you're at, you can use a mentor. OK. Third, help them, of course. OK, well, that's it, folks. My name's Kate Rizenis. I'm 16, and I'm coming for you. <laughs>Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about skills that I've maintained after switching my career into development. So, who am I? Uh, I am a recovering research scientist. <laughs> yeah, I had a background in uh, biology, uh, which seems pretty disparaging. Um, but through the help of my uh, Cincinnati's chapter of Girl Development, uh, in seven months I became a professional developer, and I've been there for a little over a year now. Uh, so the things that I brought from um, science to here, uh, because I want to uh, emphasize that just because you come from a non-traditional path and you have low technical skills coming into a career, doesn't mean that you don't have other high expertise in other areas. So uh, first thing I brought over was working with a team. Uh, now in science, <laughs> that might have looked like uh, having a primary investigator who was in charge of the research. Uh, but in development, it's become either a client or a project manager, and they have various levels of expertise in what they want. Well, I guess they all know what they want, but uh, I have to be the person that says, okay, that's your problem now, this is how I'm gonna solve it. Uh, and it's not always clear in either career, but uh, being able to think through um, a problem is, oh shoot, that's the next slide. <laughs> uh, so other things with working with a team, um, are uh, being able to utilize all of the people in the group. So we're gonna have people that are coming from different backgrounds and are used to working on either the front end, the back end, whatever, uh, but you still have to piece together everything to make a final product. Uh, and that's something that uh, I didn't expect to be as useful as it is. Um, 
but you really don't develop or code in a bubble. So you need to be able to work well with everyone that um, it takes to make things work. Um, my uh, second skill I brought over was problem solving. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, science is about you know having a problem, making experiments, and um, getting a solution. And development isn't that much different. Uh, so that might. Um, previously have been going through literature uh, and then performing an experiment. Now it's like so much easier. You go through Stack Overflow, so there's still that literature aspect, but you don't have to wait for a science experiment to last weeks to finish. You just kind of type it in and see if everything explodes or works. <laughs> uh, learning at work. Uh, so in science, that might have been weekly presentations, uh, things to say on the cutting edge of technology, uh, which uh, science is, is much more slower than technology. Uh, it might take like 15 years for a new uh, experiment to really take ground and um, become valid, I guess. Uh, and now uh, things move a lot more quickly, so I'm going to things that are more like right on the pulse uh, meetups, um, and uh, the learning just really never stops. So um, you're always con not always just learning on your own, but if you go to meetups and things like that, you also have other people, more resources to talk to. Uh, and documentation. Um, so in science, that was writing a lot of protocols uh, so that someone new could perform the experiment in the exact same way that I could. Uh, but now documentation is, is that in five minutes? People aren't waving at me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, oh, good. Uh, so um, now documentation is uh, about writing out, um, shoot, I'm so sorry, uh, requirements uh, that we need uh, for, to keep up our standards in our code uh, and in our project. And then it also might be um, a user story. So uh, in science, that might have been um, more about saying what that data means uh, and um, explaining to uh, people that don't know. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna go to the next slide. <laughs> And uh, now my surprisingly useful skills, things that I did not think would transfer over. So those things were more like core, I feel like in any new job I would have been able to utilize. Um, my background in data vis visualization is something that I didn't expect to be using all the time. But being able to have hard concepts or like a lot of numbers and make it something that anyone could just glance at and understand is something that's been incredibly useful. Uh, I also have a statistical background and I work in like surveys now, so that stats background has been really helpful. I don't know if it's always useful, but it does actually help me um, kind of understand like what's significant about even um, Oh, what is it called? Like Google Analytics and things like that, trying to piece out like what is actually important and what's just noise in your data. Uh, presenting at conferences, I did a lot. Uh, never to a tech audience that I'm scared in front of, but <laughs> I think I'm done, so. And you're done. Hi, everyone. My name is Asaf Hefet, and I am the CTO and co-founder at SNCC. And for many, many years, I was a security researcher, and today I'm going to talk about the security risk in pooling uh, in gems that we all know and love. So first of all, open source is awesome. It's great. It lets us share our work. It makes us much more productive, focusing on our core functionality and not reinventing the wheel. But open source is not equal secure. It's not equal insecure as well. But see, we are seeing many vulnerabilities in open source projects. We are all familiar with vulnerabilities like heart bleed, shell shock, emetragic, and more. And we see that attack attackers are targeting open source projects because it's usually less uh, tested for security, exploits are easy to build, and it's open source. So one vulnerability equal many uh, victims. So for every gem, every gem that you pull, for every uh, open source package that you use, do you know if its developers have any security expertise? Do you know if it's underwent any security testing? Do you know how quickly they respond to new vulnerabilities? For each dependency that you use, either directly or indirectly, it's, it's, it, it is a security risk that we need to assess. And this is a very big problem 
but the first step we should, uh, we should address is non-vulnerabilities. And security experts say that non-vulnerabilities are accounts for the major majority of successful attacks. So let's take a look at specific uh, application and go from statistic into reality. And for this, I will use Sneak to approach this problem, but there are other tools that can let you uh, at least find vulnerabilities. Oops, sorry. Um, so I'll use Sneak to test my uh, GitHub repositories. What? Oh. Uh, I need a uh, from. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. A bit hard. Okay, so I will I will try to. Uh, maybe there is something I can do to change the. Uh, no, it, it'll screw it up. We'll lose more time. Yeah. All right, so uh, the first thing that we are going to do is to uh, test for non-vulnerabilities, and we are looking at the project and the dependencies and intersect that with our open source vulnerability database. And for example, if you can see here, uh, there is the registry application. Uh, registry application, and we can try to view the test reports. And we can see here that there is seven non-vulnerabilities uh, five of them are high severity vulnerabilities, and we are able to see that one of those are from HTTP party and uh, action pack, and we are able to also read more about this vulnerability and to understand what is the actual vulnerability. In this case, an attacker can use the uh, request parameters to uh, run arbitrary uh, Ruby commands, which is the holy grail for a security hacker. So after we find the vulnerabilities, the next thing that we need to do is to fix those vulnerabilities. And in order to fix those vulnerability, we are able to open a fixed PR. So we find vulnerabilities, the next thing is to, to fix those. So we have here seven non-vulnerabilities that we saw uh, yes, uh, earlier. So by uh, creating a, a fixed pull request, we will be able to address all of those non-vulnerabilities. Uh, now it's open here. Maybe. Okay. Cool. So you can see here from GitHub screen that it opened a uh, pull request and it's uh, fixing those uh, vulnerabilities. So by clicking uh, merge pull request, we will be able to uh, merge the, uh, to fix all those vulnerabilities and to be vulnerability free. So uh, we find vulnerabilities, we fix vulnerabilities. The next thing to do is to continuously monitor for non-vulnerabilities. Because as we all know, uh, new vulnerabilities are uh, disclosed all the time and we need to make sure that we have uh, a way to respond for them. So either by tracking non-vulnerabilities or by uh, sending a pull request with alerts for those new vulnerabilities. So thank you very much. Okay, go. All right, so my name is uh, Mickey Rizenis. I'm with Team Tiny Hands over here. And I wrote my talk for the members of the majority. And as you know, in software engineering, it's pretty homogenous. So basically, it's a talk for white guys. <laughs> okay. So what happens is when you start talking about um, white guys, they get nervous and they apologize. But mo I want to assure you, most people are cool. And uh, it's, it's, oh, I just flipped slides. It's not your fault, but the GIF's not running, so we're just gonna, guys crying on the other side of that GIF. <laughs> so, uh, oh, there we go, there it is, great. Most people are cool, it's not your fault. But we do need backup in the office, you know, like um, when someone says something wrong, if you could just step up, that'd be great. But this actually isn't my talk. <sighs> Rails comp. Um, so I've been working on, um, understanding how, what it's like to be part of the minority. And most of my interactions in my life uh, are with people who look or live like I do. And this isn't a good thing, and it's a hard pattern, pattern to break. And while you might think that being a woman in tech is enough to teach me what it's like to be a minority, 
I believe I have learned more about being a minority in another arena. Uh, all my friends know where I'm going with this. I've learned more about how it feels to be different by skating at a different rink than any other activity. Um, this is skate night. I love skate night. Every Wednesday night, 7 to 10, uh, carry jelly beans. I'm there with my friends. This is the picture of that rink. It's pretty clear what the demographic is. Uh, I've done this for two to three years. Uh, I started skating at a Raleigh rink about six to eight months ago. This is my Raleigh rink. I love this rink. Um, it's a different demographic, and there's a lot different about it. The carry rink, um, we have a certain style. We go fast around the outside, and we turn together. All the moves are choreographed. It takes a long time to get there. I've broken bones in the process. I love the style of skating that I do, and I've become pretty good at it. And uh, that's my daughter, my younger daughter, Faith, there in the green, and my best friend, Laura, on the other side. But um, the Raleigh rink has a very different style, and uh, it's rhythm skating. And so there's more pairs and group skating, and uh, there's couple skating, which means they're, they're touching me which I wasn't used to. <laughs> um, and these require different skating skills. So um, the differences in skating, first of all, it's different equipment. My skates aren't the same. Speed skates go fast. I can blow out anyone in the Raleigh rink almost. Um, but if I put on the artistic skates, I'm slow as a snail. And there's more edge work. Edge work's when you're moving side to side, and it's a, something that you don't do a lot of times when you're running fast down the, the straightaway, because if you do that, you're going to bite it. Um, you are skating in close proximity to each other, so if you put your legs out wide, you're taking you, your partner, and a bunch of other people down with you. It's a bad idea. Um, the speed of the rink is slower. It just, it, I can't go my full speed, uh, even in my speed skates, because it's, it's dangerous. There's a looser definition of a normal lap uh, pattern. Uh, people come out of everywhere at the Raleigh rink, and carry, it's all dress right dress. Everyone's just going right around the circle. And like I said, there's more touching, which was an adjustment for me. Um, oh yeah, that's Kim. I love Kim. Kim's a great person. All right, so the benefits of skating someplace is, uh, uh, are easy. I've met some amazing people, people that I wouldn't meet anyplace else. My social media pages reflect more varied opinions and backgrounds. And no question, I'm a better skater for doing different style on different equipment. The difficult benefits that I've received are I've had to rethink some of my convenient opinions, and I've had to deal with the re reality that I have biases. Um, the things about this experience that have made those things come to light was that I was clearly a minority. Uh, there was a high risk of embarrassment. Physically, I appear very different, and the difference is unescapable. I needed help because I couldn't skate in that style, so I needed someone to teach me that style. And I went to the, I go to that rink without a support group. I don't have someone to run away and hide with. I need to be part of that group. And so I had to ask myself, what makes me uncomfortable? What highlights the differences between me and the group? And what acts, ac actions by the majority comforted me? And when I know those things, I can take that back to when I'm in the majority. Now I can use those same actions to comfort the minority. So it's not the same. Skating is voluntary. I don't have to do it every day. It's not critical. I get a paycheck if I skate or don't skate. But there are a lot of people that are facing minority status and they have to do it every day in the workplace, and you have no clue what they're going through. So the takeaway is, you want to put yourself in a minority situation and figure out what things make you comfortable. Then take that learning, that comfort, take it back to your job, and help the people that are, the people that are underrepresented in tech, help them feel comfortable at work. I'm Mickey, Team Tiny Hands. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hartle, and uh, I have a just two things to talk about mainly. One is about what I'm up to. People ask me, what are you up to? So for those of you who don't know, I'm, among other things, the author of the Ruby on Rails tutorial, which some of you may have read in here. Anyone, anyone here read the Ruby on Rails tutorial? All right, cool. Uh, so one thing I, I did recently is I actually added a more, more advanced tutorial. There's a, a short tutorial called Learn Enough Action Cable to be Dangerous. This is a follow-on to the Rails tutorial. But those of you who've done the Rails tutorial know that it's, uh, it's pretty dense in places. It's pretty tough to get through all, what is it, 14 chapters now? It, it's a, it's a, a steep climb. So over the, past, uh, over the past year and a half or so, I've been building out an intro sequence under this Learn Enough brand. And so I want to show you how, how that's going. So we start with novice developer, and this is where you, you go. You go to developer fundamentals. And that's these uh, three tutorials, learn enough command line, text editor, and git to be dangerous. And then I'm working on uh, 
Learn, I published the online version of Learn Enough HTML to be dangerous, and then I'm working with my designer friend and co-founder uh, on CSS and layout, JavaScript, so that's a, a second trilogy, and then the third trilogy, again, to be written is Ruby, Sinatra, and Ruby on Rails. So this is meant to be a much uh, gentler slope for people who are just starting out. Uh, like everything I do, there's a free online version of the entire tutorial, and then you can also buy eBooks and standalone videos. Um, there's also a uh, subscription service called the Learn Enough Society, and th this covers all of these different tiers. And one of the things about it is, is that it has the full streaming videos, and then also um, there are places to answer all the exercises. So you can uh, answer your exercises using uh, Markdown, and you can also see other people's answers if you want to see um, the solutions. I, my answers are here, which I hope are generally right, although if they're wrong, let me know. Uh, and then uh, you can see what other people do. One of the aspects of my own philosophy is I always like to have a, a way for people to get this information for free. So it, it's a subscription service, but there is a scholarship you can apply for, and, and there's a free tier. We get applications from all over the world, which is really inspiring. Um, the second thing I want to talk about really quickly here is beer. So, the, uh, yeah, so the, the Rails tutorial software, when you release software, you have to decide what's your license going to be. And so the license that I mainly went with was the MIT license, which is very commonly used in open source software. It's pretty simple. You can, this is the whole thing. Um, another common open source license is uh, this, the GNU General Public License. Some of you may have heard of it. It's known as the GPL. And this is what it is. <laughs> so what happened is, is uh, this man, Paul Henning Camp, was just so disgusted by this situation that he said, this is ridiculous. I want a really, really simple license, even simpler than MIT. So the Ruby and Rails tutorial source code is uh, dual licensed under the MIT license and Poole Henning, Camp's, Poole Henning Camp's Beerware license. And the Beerware license said, the, beer, the Beerware license says, Michael Harder wrote, well, it's your name here, wrote this code. As long as you retain this notice, you can do whatever you want with this stuff. If we meet someday and you think this stuff is worth it, you can buy me a beer in return. <laughs> so so pe people have been using this. I've gotten a lot of beers over the years for this. It, it actually works. And so in this spirit, at, at uh, RailsConf, I ran this, this event, and so I'm doing it again here at RubyConf because it was so much fun. Th uh, tonight is the, the Rails, tutorial beer war Rails Tutorial Beerware Night. Uh, it's uh, tonight, it starts at 7 o'clock, and uh, it's local. It's at the uh, Palomino Restaurant and Bar at uh, Fifth and Vine. So uh, if you go to my pinned tweet, actually, If you go to my pinned tweet at, at uh, Twitter, twitter.com slash mhartle, you can see the, uh, the information here for the Eventbrite. Uh, so I hope to see you there. I can talk more about, uh, about Learn Enough. So Learn Enough is at learnenough.com, and that's also uh, where you can find more information about all of those uh, tutorials that are in progress, as well as the Learn Enough Society subscription service. Thank you very much. So technical interviews stink. No one is really surprised by this, but the more important detail is that technical interviews are part of the process of building your business. So when they stink, your business can stink. All right? Now, we know about whiteboarding, we know about questionnaires, we even know about take-home exercises. All of these approaches also stink. They don't give us enough information to be able to figure out whether the candidates we're interviewing are really the people that are best for our company. All the common tools that we tend to use to assess candidates are less than optimal for identifying the candidates we really want. Most of us want candidates that are creative, collaborative, and competent. We don't normally just care about technical competency, we want more than just that. And so we need assessment tools that are better than what we typically use, than what we already have, what we're familiar with. One of the biggest problems that comes in with our development tools or with our interviewing tools is that they are contrived and they sacrifice clarity for brevity. They sacrifice meaningful information for timeliness. Now, at Mavenlink, we pair. 
all the time. That's how we work. And so we start our interview process with pairing. We can't use traditional tools because they don't tell us enough about the candidates that we want to interview, so we don't use them. Instead, we use pair programming as a way to interview our candidates, and this is a technique that can help you as well. Because we pair every day, we start pairing in our interviews, and this approach could help you. Even if you don't adopt pair programming as a practice, this is still a methodology that can give you more information about the people that you're talking to. Our very first interview takes about an hour, and while it does help us gauge technical competence, the candidate actually writes no code. Instead, they are asked to tell the interviewer how to implement a series of features in a test-driven environment, and the interviewer actually writes the code for them. What we're looking for is the ability to communicate technical concepts clearly to another person without having to take control. The interview that we do uh, following this is actually an on-site interview where we call people in and we ask them to pair with people in our office. We have them work alongside our engineers for a day and we get a really good feel for how they work, whether or not they're comfortable in the very intense context that pair programming provides. And it gives them a very good picture of how we work as a company. It helps both of us understand the relationship that we're looking into. Again, even if you don't use pair programming as part of your team's process, you can still learn much more about your candidates if you actually take some time to work with them as part of your interview process. And the earlier in this process that you can learn these details, the better for you and for the people you're interviewing. Pairing in interviews provides an excellent way for you and your candidate to gain the maximum amount of information about the relationship that you're both investigating and exploring. But how can you do this in your existing process? Jim Weirich's Ruby rendition of the Gilded Rose Cotta is a great exercise to lead people through. It can give you a great handle on how well someone works through the process of refactoring. Try getting fancy with Fibonacci. Don't start with solving the problem. Go on to generic and local memorization. You can get a really good feel for a person's mastery of a language by seeing how far they can take that exercise in terms of performance. Try writing a blog in an hour, not just 15 minutes, and, and add some additional features, styling, front-end capabilities, to get a more full-stack assessment of the candidates that you're talking to. Whatever you do, try doing it with your candidates in a way that gives you more useful information than the tired, highly scripted, and generally unreliable methods we all know and have come to rely on. Thank you. I'm James Thompson. I work for Mavenlink. Check us out online, and you can follow me on Twitter as well. Hi, I'm Victoria Gonda. I am a developer at Collective Idea. We're in Holland, Michigan. Um, this is my first RubyConf. It's been awesome. Um, <laughs> so I've been dancing a lot longer than I've been programming since I was in kindergarten. So it's been a really big part of my life. And actually, dancing is kind of what got me into programming. And if you want to hear that story, you'll have to come find me. Um, but because of this, I'm often comparing dance and programming. And there's a lot of comparisons to be made, but I'm just going to look at one of them today that I think a lot of us can use. So both dancers and programmers always have room for improvement and learning. Otherwise, we wouldn't need Google or classes, and none of us would be in this room right now. And because of that, we always are in the position to receive instruct, instruction, correction, and critique. And what I think can be unique is the way that we respond to this feedback. It can be really easy to become disheartened or take it as a personal attack, or you can go the route of just ignoring the feedback and assume that you know best. But I think that there are better options than this. When I'm in a dance class and I receive a correction, I get really proud and I'm really happy about it. And I started thinking about what reasons this is and how I can apply that to when I'm coding. And the reasons might not be obvious, but I think they're reasons that I think we all can use. So the first thing is when you receive feedback, it's an opportunity to learn. When someone gives you feedback, they're taking time out of their day to share some information with you. And you can be excited about that conversation. They saw that they have information that they can share and they think that you'd be willing to learn. 
So you can be proud that they're spending that time to help you learn. Once you've decided to make it a positive experience, you can start working on making it a habit. When I receive a correction in a dance class, I try to apply it everywhere I can from there on out. Sometimes you can even find me at my desk at work practicing some things. And you can do the same thing in your code. If you start practicing these things and repeating it wherever you can, you start creating that mental muscle memory so that later on you find yourself using that thing without even thinking about it, which makes you a stronger programmer. Okay, so you can be excited about getting feedback, but that doesn't mean you need to seek it out. You still need to try your best. Because if you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, even though you've gotten feedback, it shows that you're not really listening and you're not really learning. And sure, we're all human, those repetitions will happen, we'll make mistakes. But what we can do is we can be really intentional about not repeating those things. So that brings us back here. At some point or another, we're all gonna receive some sort of feedback. And we can make a difference in the way that we respond to it. So you, when you get it, it's not a bad thing. It's not that you did something wrong. It's not an attack. It's just a change or an edit. It's opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn, to share information with one another. It's an opportunity to grow stronger and become a better programmer. It's an opportunity to be intentional about not repeating a mistake. By practicing these things, I think we can all become better programmers and better teammates. So the next time that you receive feedback, can you be excited to learn from it? And can you strive to apply it everywhere that you can until it becomes a habit? And can you be determined not to make the same mistake again? I'm gonna leave you with these questions today. If you wanna continue the conversation at all, you can find me on Twitter at TTGanda, and thank you all for listening. Hi, I'm Jonathan Slate. I work at Patients Like Me in Cambridge, Mass. I created these little creatures, I call them Timix. They help me understand Git. I put them on our tech blog on Patients Like Me and maybe they can help you too. Now that's what the blog is. What is a Timic? Real quick, uh, it's just a commit. Uh, so here we go, uh, this is the blog. Um, and I'm gonna go through this really fast because I don't have a lot of time, but you should look at it later. Um, and it has like actual Git stuff down there too. So this is a Timic. Uh, Timics aren't like people. Usually it only takes one Timic to make a child Timic. <laughs> uh, but Timics are like people in that they are all unique individuals. Each Timic is a complete Timic in its own right. They're quite adamant about this. The Timics have an impatient and ruthless god named Ved. Ved doesn't like to wait and also kills Timics with reckless abandon. <laughs> Over many generations, Ved can decide to add and remove various features. Uh, this forms a family tree. In this simple case, our tree has just one branch. This is not the kind of tree where each child has a subset of the features of the parent. It's not a perfect metaphor, but. Um, Timics are more like people than that. Children are just as complete as their parents. Uh, one Timic can have more than one child Timic. When this happens, we get a new branch on the family tree. What is a branch? Really, it's just a pointer to a single Timic. Uh, there's also a special pointer called head, which points to one of the branch pointers. Head is the branch on which VED is currently changing features. When a new branch is created, it just points to the commit head points to. So creating a new branch is very fast, which pleases the impatient VED. Usually head is moved to the new branch as well, so VED can make changes on that branch. As new Timics are created on a branch, the pointer just moves forward. Let's say VED makes some changes on a branch called happy. Later, VED might want to include those changes on the master branch. In the case above, in the case above VED updates the original branch to point to the Timic on the branch with the new features. It's important to note that no new Timic is created here. Both branches now just point to the same Timic. However, this can only work when there aren't any changes in the other branch. Once the merge is done, VED mercilessly kills the happy branch. This is a fast forward merge. Thankfully, no Timics are harmed in the process. They are all just on the master branch. Often features from, one, from more than one generation have to be combined. 
When two branches are merged, that means you have a tenant with two parents. But even a tenant with two parents is a unique individual. Really, go back and look if you want. No Timix before this one looked just like this. Sometimes two branches need to be merged together, but uh, the features of the parents conflict. This is like a triangle horn and a normal horn. Uh, if there is a conflict between features, VED must come in to resolve them. Sometimes VED wants to pick Timix from one branch and put them onto another branch. This is cherry picking. Uh, here, VED wants to apply the hair and the beard to the Timix with the horns. First, the differences between Timix on the hairy branch are calculated, the new Timix are created as children of the Timix with the horns, with the changes included. Note, however, that only the changes from the Timix VED specified are applied. Here, VED only picks the Timic with the, with the beard to apply, so the new Timic is created that only has the beard and no hair on top. It's crazy. Uh, sometimes history can look a bit messy when two branches uh, come together. So VED can rewrite history to make it look like there was only ever one branch rebasing. Before, we saw how changes on another branch are used to create new Timics on the current branch, but here we do something different. Changes from the hairy branch are reapplied on the hairy branch. Um, but new Timics have a different, but the new Timics have a different parent, the Timic with horns who did not exist when the hairy branch was first created. Now, when we merge the hairy branch back into the original branch, the pointer just gets moved forward to the latest Timic. When VED is done, it really looks like there was only ever one branch. That's all I have for now. Um, I hope, I hope to add more in the future. Uh, if you have thoughts, please leave them in the comments on the blog post. Uh, patients like me, yes, we are hiring. And um, at Jay Slate is my Twitter. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's Raj. He was only 15 years old, Master Wang. <laughs> I'm the other Michael Kane. All the information that's pertinent is there. I'm going to do a little shot about MochaJS and probably why are we talking about MochaJS and RubyConf? Well, uh, I work for Comcast, your neighborhood uh, friendly super conglomerate in the media world. And uh, a lot of our jobs currently existed in Sidekick, but they've kind of outgrown it. So we're moving over to AWS Lambda, which uses Node to imply all of its stateless operations. So how do you learn a new language? Yeah. Tests can help you break stuff and learn by, from it. So there's great news. If you want to learn Node.js, there's already a test suite you already know, mocha.js. So we're going to do a little kata real quick, the old calculator function, right? This is what an R spec test would look like for the calculator. R spec is your friend. This is what a Mocha.js test suite looks like. Mocha is your new friend. Now, you don't just sit down and start banging out JavaScript, right? Well, it's pretty easy. So let's check out what an R spec test would look like. Simp I'd describe is simply a function that calls another function it, which calls yet another function expect, which evaluates your function and its return. MochaJS is exactly the same thing. Aside from a little bit of syntax difference, describe is a function that calls a function it, which evaluates a function with should, which evaluates your function, and then provides the same return. Now, the only exception is MochaJS handles callbacks in a little bit of a different way due to the asynchronous nature of Node. So as you can see, if we were going to get a 200 request from Google.com, you gotta slip that done into the parameter for the it call so you can tell the test when the test is done. Otherwise, it's going to sit there and just wait for the rest of nothing to happen. This is how you feel when you write your first lambda. Those are all my sidekick workers dead behind me. <laughs> my name is Michael Kane. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Jamie. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about Clearwire, which is front end development in Ruby. So, uh, the way this works is it, uh, it uses this, this tool called Opal to compile your, your Ruby code into JavaScript. And if you're using Rails, then there's a sim pretty simple uh, gem to install to that will automate, automate that uh, compilation for you through the asset pipeline. Uh, why would you want to do this? Well, I'm more familiar with Ruby uh, than with JavaScript. Switching back and forth between languages is really difficult. Um, when you're used to Ruby, it, uh, JavaScript can be very confusing. And you probably have a JS build system anyway that compiles your JS to, into other JS. 
Some people like to say that you know if, if you're programming for the front end, just just learn JavaScript. Uh, but the problem is you're not just learning JavaScript. You're also learning all of these different, uh, all of these other other concepts at the same time. And if you if you don't know one or more of them, if you're not familiar with them, then you have to learn them in a language you don't understand. And so this uh, also swapping back and forth between between two different languages gives you a sort of um, uh, th this weird context switch, and all of a sudden you'll be writing your Ruby in JavaScript or your JavaScript in Ruby. Uh, and so the ideal is to get uh, one, uh, write one language on both. Uh, now, Node, Node exists to write JavaScript on the server side, but I want to write uh, Ruby on the client side instead. And so what? Uh, so I wrote this, this framework called Clearwater, which is uh, a Ruby front end framework that gives you components, virtual DOM rendering, uh, optional routing, if you're uh, if if you need to to uh, render based on the URL, and if you also you can opt into server side rendering, and so this is kind of what that what that looks like. So your uh, your um, uh, your layout like you you have you have you load up your your dependencies, just like in regular Ruby code. It uses a, actually a sprockets directive. Uh, then you you create this class. That it, that includes a mixin that provides a couple of methods that you, you know a bunch of methods that you can use uh, to you know this uh, this tag DSL like h1 div span all those uh, and then you instantiate the application and you invoke it and the application itself is just an object that has a component a router and an element to render into those last two are optional and then you just invoke the app and uh, when you want to re-render it you just call app render and components are pretty simple. They're just they you, they include a mixin, define a render method that gives you a uh, that uses this, this tag DSL. And you can see here we're just like to make a div tag that has some content. You you call the div method and pass it some content. Uh, you can pass in properties as well, just like React JS uses the DOM, the DOM properties API instead of the HTML attributes for reasons that are actually kind of terrible. Um, but so. We don't want to use camel case names because we're, we're using Ruby. Well, that's fine. We can use snake case names. You can use either one. Uh, also, because I screw this up in React all the time, uh, you, could, you don't have to use class name at all. You can say class. Um, so, uh, and then components, they can just they can take other components as content. The uh, components and the virtual DOM nodes that it generates with, with div and span and all those, other, all, all those other methods are pretty much interchangeable. Um, you know, you can combine multiple multiple uh, layers of content with uh, with arrays because single tiled nodes are not very interesting. Uh, handling UI events, you know, uh, on click, on submit, on whatever, uh, you just pass a proc, and that proc that proc just compiles down to a JavaScript function that it gets executed on that event. Uh, you, you, so instead of in, in place of a proc, you can use a lambda uh, or a method object uh, like. You know the result of the method method, um, or any any other r object that responds to call, and so you can just define whatever whatever class it has do, it has dot call on it. Uh, I think I'm probably running low on time, Evan. And, okay. okay. Let's see. Oh, right. Fantastic. All right. So uh, still have a lot to get through. So this is just an, an example of something that you could call that you could call it takes uh, it takes the event uh, as a parameter to the call. Uh, the call method. Uh, you can use render caching because performance is a thing. Uh, routing for, uh, to, to render render different code based on the URL or render different content based on the URL. Uh, you can all obviously get uh, parameters just like you know very similar to how you can with Rails controllers with the params method. Just returns a hash. Uh, navigating using a, uh, a special link component. Things that that, and that handles crap that. Uh, that really sucks in a lot of other front-end apps where you have back and forward buttons getting all screwed up. Oh God, running low on time. Uh, th th there's a whole bunch of gems on that also work with it. Performance is fantastic. Uh, don't listen to micro benchmarks because they're terrible. Uh, hit, uh, uh, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Yurie Yamane. I will talk about the toilet implementation is MRuby. <laughs> this is my talk at RubyCaggy in this year. At yesterday's Eric session, he in introduced my talk. Thank you for Eric. So I would like to talk about it here. Have you ever seen Japanese high-tech toilet? The Japanese toilet automatically opens and closes the lid. When 
<laughs> human ability. The Japanese toilet has a washlet, one more washer, and when you press a button, it will wash you. It will <laughs> wash you with one water instead of toilet paper. Furthermore, the lid automatically open and close when a person approaches. Please, please see Wikipedia for details. I made a mo model of this washlet with Lego Mindstorms. This is a washlet made with, with Lego Mindstorms because it is a wash, washlet developed in community called Sesame. It is called Cesaret. I will show you a movie, but before that, I will explain the action of it. At the beginning, the lid is closed. As you approach it to it, sensor detects you, and lid opens like it. What is <laughs> sit down, you can open the washlet. Because if the washlet moves before sitting, the floor becomes submerged. When you press the button, it starts spraying. If you push the button during spraying, the spray will stop. When you stand up and go up, the sensor detects that you are gone, the lid closes. So please watch a movie. Ah. As you approach it, sensor detector and lid opens. When you push, you sit, push button, it starts spraying. <laughs> if you push the button during spraying, the spray will stop. When you stand up, the sensor detector you are gone, the lid closes. <laughs> Thank you. Cesar used two sensors, three motors, and two push buttons. The ultrasonic sensor detects person approaching. The color sensor determines whether a person is sitting. The motor opens and closes the lid and performs a spray action. The buttons start and stop spraying and start flashing. I use real-time OS called EBCRT of Topaz and made that program with MRB. But EBC is a bit expensive so that you cannot easily trade. For this reason, now I am developing another cesaret with EV3. In this version, I use microprocessor board GRP, made by a Japanese manufacturer named Lunesas. It is, made, it is embedded and Arduino compatible, so easy to develop. This is a new cesaret I am developing. However, I fortunately I forget to bring a battery box from Japan, so I can't demo it here now. I'm very sad. But I would like to show more details next year. Thank you for listening. Hello, Ruby friend. Hello. Hi. I'm Kei from Tokyo, and nice to meet you. I'm neither. Ruby committer nor uh, Rails committer as well. Uh, I'm just a, a fan of Ruby and I'm so glad uh, to see you all to say hi. Yeah. And uh, okay, to, today I'm, I will give 
I'll talk a little bit about uh, my personal project. Okay, uh, do you know this logo? Uh, how many here guys, you know uh, the, this logo? Uh, could you raise your hand? Okay, maybe 10% or so. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, okay, Evan, thanks, thanks. <laughs> yes, yes, nice, it's nice. And uh, okay, let's start. So Julia is a programming language, relatively new, still uh, four years old, young. And uh, uh, it's a dynamic uh, type language. And uh, it's really fast, as fast as C, uh, uh, in my opinion. And uh, Julia has, uh, uh, okay, uh, maybe I don't have enough time to talk about, uh, but so in short, uh, write some Julia code, then you will get uh, LLVM, IR, or native code uh, very, very easily. Uh, this is some demo. So this is the Julia repo. And if you type, okay, maybe clearly you can see that the function hello uh, is defined here. And so if you call hello, then uh, you will get the string. But in Julia, uh, you call code underscore LLVM and you pass the uh, a pointer to that function, then you will get the uh, LLVM IR very easily, right? And also the code underscore native function call will uh, give you the native code. It's really, so it's so easy. Okay, Julia is a thing now, uh, but we are in RubyConf, I know. <laughs> so in, uh, my experiment is, what if uh, we can write some Ruby code which can be translated to Julia, so then maybe you will get the Julia uh, LLVM IR uh, transpired from Julia, which is comes from Ruby, right? So write Ruby code, then you will get uh, LLVM IR or native code. So that's the thing I want to show you today. So Julia Liza, is, which is the Ruby gem, uh, actually it's a very proof of concept-ish gem, so Please do not rely on very much, but it's, it's just experimental. But it, it's actually working. And uh, maybe I can show you some demo today, and that's that everything. Well, uh, OK. And no. <laughs> so. Uh, grab this one now. Okay, cool. And okay. So the simple demo is maybe, for example, okay. Ah, okay. Here you see two plus three. It's too uh, simple, but the Maybe you can see some, for example, 3.3, for example. Ah, okay, still. Then, <laughs> well, what would be good case? Okay, then maybe, uh, uh, well, echo uh, def hello uh, to times three. So we, this is just the Ruby method, right? And Julia Liza. Okay, you get the Julia function here. So what is interesting here is next you can, uh, well, uh, what to do next is maybe it's called LLVM, hello, something like this. <laughs> Just take this operation. So now you get uh, complete the uh, complete Julia program right now, which will be converted. Oh, well, ah, okay, I can. Uh, okay, sorry, you're over time. okay, okay, which is translated. Yeah. To like this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the timer is great. Hey, everybody. 
Hi, it's really nice to be here back at Enron. <laughs> uh, so I'm Ryder Timberlake, I work at Salesforce. I'm an Iron Yard grad. Uh, yeah, woo. Um, and uh, I realize it's out of policy to uh, give a talk with a backpack on, but I'm afraid if I set it down, I might forget it, and if I forget my backpack, Salesforce might banish me to the roof. <laughs> Good, it was, worth, it was worth bringing the prop just for that. <laughs> cool. Well, I wanted to ask a question here to kick things off, and that question is, in 20 words or less, what is the biggest cultural or procedural problem you're facing at work right now? Obviously, we only have time to take a few answers. Biggest culture, yes. Trust. Fear of change. One more time. <laughs> Running out of coffee. Uh, I mean, what I'm about to talk about might help with that in an indirect way still. So trust and fear of change. Do you mind if I focus on those? OK, great. Awesome. So I want to piggyback off of what James was saying earlier about this whole pair programming deal. Uh, how many of you have any interest in pair programming? Could you raise your hand? Of those who have their hands raised right now, could you keep them up for a second? Sorry, I should really spec everything at the beginning so I'm not pissing people off. So of those of you who have your hands raised so very kindly right now, could you leave them raised if you use pair programming in any kind of regular way whatsoever at your job? Uh-huh. Oh, that's, that's, hey, I'm very pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that makes me really happy, actually. Um, so of those who put your hands down earlier, do you find it a hard sell, or are you trying at work to, to push this? Yeah. Yeah, I find the same thing. <laughs> it's tough. Do you have any interest in this kind of thing? In the pairing? OK, awesome. Cool, cool. Yeah, for, for mentoring. Very cool. So you, you've seen this work out? I want to do a thing now. We're really breaking yeah. the fifth oh, wall. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's often good, like, either I'll instruct and they'll type, or vice versa, or switch back and forth. It's a, you know, them typing is a good way to make sure that I'm not completely losing them. And you know, me typing can be a good way for me to run off in a random direction and lose them. So you find that it gives you a lot of feedback in terms of where they're at? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is anybody getting the fact that I didn't plan this out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, pair programming is something that I have found in my limited experience to be incredibly useful as far as building trust, as far as overcoming the fears that we might have that are just naturally part of working in a landscape that tends to move at a very frantic and frenetic pace that does not really concern itself over much with important things in the Ruby community, such as developer happiness, such as building tools which are enjoyable to use, which are transparent, which provide good logging, airing. We could go on for a very long time in this particular vein. Um, Pairing can address some of those things very directly when you put two heads together and you have good communication. Uh, if you are one of those people who put your hands down and you are interested in maybe uh, trying to get something going at your place of employment, obviously uh, I would recommend, just from what I've seen uh, since I've been here, speaking with some of the Mavenlink folks, it's, it's very exciting uh, what they're doing over there, and I'm sure from what I saw, there are a number of other people where this is very common at, at your place of work, yeah? Okay, she, she nodded and said that's correct. <laughs> so yeah, and if you're interested in kicking it off, uh, I would document meticulously what you're doing. I would document your use case, I would document your pros and cons, right? And any other observations you have and just keep a really rigorous log so you have some empirical data that you can go off of. And I wish you the best of luck. So, uh, a lot of what I do these days is to try and make a program faster. And if your benchmark's noisy, that's kind of an interesting process, by which I mean often I'm wrong. 
Uh, so normally when you profile, what do you do? You, uh, you run a few times. How many? Well, I pick a number. You find out how long it takes to run, you divide by how many times you ran it, and then for the second program you do about the same thing. So that's enough, right? Well, it's not real deterministic. Um, you're gonna get different, time, different results every time you do it. Uh, if you run it on your pro computer that you use for anything else, other stuff runs in the background, or if you run on a dedicated EC2 instance, you're assuming Amazon will never run anything in the background. Yeah, you get different results if you keep trying it. How many times do you have to do it before you get the right answer? Eh. So, you've got a bunch of samples and you ask, are these things basically the same? Hey, like statistics, that's kind of what it does. Cool, uh, Welch's t-test. I looked it up in Wikipedia, so you don't have to. And doesn't this kind of look like another thing we've seen? Yes, A-B testing, the other thing where we say, turn to the statistician, do, do what he said. Um, so, uh, if you want to write a Welch's t-test, go use SciRuby. Um, why not write it? Even I mean, Wikipedia tells you how to write it. You can just write it, right? No, never write a statistics test you don't know cold. I, if you get it right the first time, you're way ahead of me. So, okay, I wrote a little program to do it for you using SciRuby. I didn't write the Welch's t-test there either. Uh, I called it AB Compare. It's got some cute options, but mostly if you've got time to wait for it to run a minute, don't use the options. Just type AB Compare and then put the first command in quotes and the second command in quotes. So if you thought, hey, there's this ACK thing that searches your directories for a particular phrase and there's, there's Silver Searcher AG, which claims to be faster, I wonder if it's faster. You'd type AB Compare, AG, the thing you want to find, ACK, the thing you want to find, hit return, uh, go for a coffee because it's waiting until it gets statistical significance. So like an A-B test, it always takes way too long to run. But that's okay. You can get a coffee, it'll sit and run. Uh, Silver Searcher, for the record, is about 36 times faster in my Ruby source directory. So you may find a similar thing because it skips all the built files and intermediate stuff, which is important if you've got a bunch of C and, C and object files. Yeah, now I know. Uh, if two things are clearly different, it'll run for a little while and then pretty quickly stop because statistical significance is easy if the two things are very far apart. So it'll give you smaller and smaller p-values because that's how A-B testing works. And then it'll stop and tell you about how many times faster it is. Um, if they're the same, it'll keep running and trying because it can't find a difference and eventually it'll give up and say, as far as I can tell, they're the same because that's how the statistics wind up working. Uh, or as I say here, p-value stays high, no convergence. Same thing. Uh, I use it for big stuff, and so it does work for big stuff. If you've got Ruby in one directory, Ruby in another directory, you built them both, and you're saying, did I make this faster or not? Turns out you can tell AB compare to CD into one directory and run a benchmark, CD into another directory and run the same benchmark. It'll cheerfully go back and forth running the two. So you can eventually you know, find that out. Uh, so OptCaret, which is a benchmark some of you have heard about in these talks, um, you can use it to check the stuff. It does actually work. Uh, I'm using the slightly more complicated AB prof, but it's the same gem. It's basically the same program. Um, so if you turn profiling on, is it slower, for instance? Yeah, it's like three times slower. You could run it once and get more or less the answer, but hey, look, statistical significance. That's probably good. Uh, if you, co go if you uh, compile in Google PerfTools support, is it slower? Not as far as I can tell, running many, many, many times. So that's, that's good to know. Again, it's nice to be able to check, and this is one where if you run side by side, you pretty much can't tell because OptGarrett is noisy. The benchmarks we're using are noisy. Uh, I also found out you can turn inlining way up. It shows how on the, on the bottom there. When you're building Ruby and you can get a seven to 10% speed up, there's a cute blog post I wrote about it. But again, you can check it, and if your benchmarks are noisy, it's hard to tell. This can be a good way to check, did I speed anything up? Anyway, OptGarrett's noisy, takes a lot of runs. That's what I built this for. Uh, can you get a copy? Great, yeah, it's on RubyGems. Uh, if you gem install abprof and you do that AB compare thing, it just works, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I wrote several blog posts about it on engineering.appfolio.com, so, you know, plug for that. Is this a new idea? No, OptCaret has a script to do some statistical profiling stuff. It's just hard-coded to OptCaret. People have done this before, but it's nice to have a really easy tool. Uh, any questions? Nope. Awesome. Hi, I re I'm Chris Vinoy, I'm from Indianapolis. I recently did a event called Plimlo Magadi. Um, that's spelled, uh, I'm not gonna spell it. It stands for Programming Languages I've Been Meaning to Try but Haven't Gotten Around to Yet. And I wanna strongly encourage you, it's just pick a Saturday, give people coffee, give people pizza, have them come in, leave their families and woes behind, and concentrate on some programming language they haven't tried lately. Sometimes that's Ruby. And that's how it's done. This is your daily reminder that there is still good things in the world. 
and good people. I implore everyone who hears this to be the latter and build the former. Thank you very much. I'm Marmite Junction. Hey, there's some slides. Hi, I'm Misha. Much like Noah, I also work at Appfolio. Yes, we are hiring. Yes, we talk a lot. Um, the title of my talk is That Was Easy, Applying Your Work Skills to a Side Project. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about a side project I've been working on, am currently working on, and will continue to work on. So it started with a user problem, as these things often do. Um, up in the corner there is my grandmother. Uh, she is fantastic. She lives in Portland. Um, but over the past decade, she's been developing some um, low-level dementia. Um, it's actually been great for her because she's been forgetting bad things and been generally really positive because every day is the best day ever, which is awesome. But um, she really loves watching nature documentaries and travel documentaries. And one problem is that she can't really use mo modern technology anymore. So this is a problem. You know, I like it when she can watch things that she's enjoying. So. Uh, I started thinking about ways that I could provide her with a simple uh, a solution to that problem. This problem has some well-defined constraints. As I mentioned, she's not very technical, um, so that, that's a huge constraint right there. She has nurses, they're very good people, and they, they work really hard, but there are a lot of people for them to take care of. So the solution I build has to be easy and fast, so that they can know that it's working and move on to the next person that they are working with. It started with a gag toy. Uh, this is the Staples That Was Easy button, actually called the Easy button, but I don't like that name. Um, if you don't know it, it's really obnoxious. It's really fun to play when you uh, like merge something in. It's really fun to play when you beat someone at foosball that you're very contentious with, and it's very fun to play randomly. Um, and I was playing around with this button one day, because that's what I do, it's the kind of person I am, and uh, I was thinking to myself, this is a really great interface, right? It's a button. You press it, a thing happens. You press it, a thing happens. It's reliable, it's tactile, it's fun. What if I can combine these two things and use the button as a solution to my user problem? So it started simply. Um, I started by taking a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is just small enough to fit in the bottom of a That Was Easy button, and I wired up a little button to it. I soldered it on. And I made it so that on the Raspberry Pi, when you press the button, um, a little Python script would say, played. And when you press it again, it would say, stop. All right, very simple. And then I iterated on it, just like we do every day. So I took the script, and I was like, OK, well, eventually we're going to be able to play video files. But we don't need to start by playing. Let's start by picking random videos. Uh, my grandmother doesn't really care which one she's watching. So I created a directory and modified the script so that when you press the button, it would say, play, and then the name of a random file in that directory. And when you press it again, it would say, stop. Press it again, play, new random file. You guys get the idea. Then I took apart the That Was Easy button, which, by the way, is really fun and really easy. That is a very well-built button. Like, the tactile, it's fantastic. Um, and I slid the, it's really good. Um, and I slid the Raspberry Pi into the bottom, replacing the, the speaker. Um, and then I wired my button, I replaced their button with mine and ran the wiring down to the Raspberry Pi and put the button back together um, and ran an HDMI cable and a power cable at the back. When you hit the button now, um, instead of, uh, sorry, now when you hit the That Was Easy button, you get the same thing before, right? Play and the movie name. The final change, of course, was to, instead of saying play movie name, uh, call a movie player, and it played the video at full screen, press the button again, and it kills the movie player. It isn't over yet, um, so I'm going up to Portland next week, it's my favorite city, um, to visit my grandmother, and I will be user testing this with her. So I will be testing it with her, with her nurses, figuring out where there are usability issues that I can fix, because this really does need to be simple and reliable. A um, couple of things that I know I need to do, I need to set up a splash screen, because the Raspberry Pi is a little slow to boot, um, that lets people know that it is booting and not to try pressing, because you don't want to set false expectations for people. Um, and I need to set up a screen um, that shows at the desktop, you know, a background image that lets people know that if they press the button, a video will play. All right, that's it. Um, like I said, I will be in Portland next week for the next week and a half. Um, this is my first time at RubyConf. You guys are awesome. Like, please hit me up. I would love to grab a coffee, grab dinner, go to a brewery, a microbrewery, a micro microbrewery. Like, you know, let me know. And again, um, I work at Appfolio. We are hiring. We're a really fun place to work. Noah is a fantastic person to work with. So, you know, let me know if you're interested. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm, I feel very lucky. Uh, so I'm Jeff Foster. I'm a computer science professor at the University of Maryland College Park. I've been having a blast at RubyConf. This is great. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about some work I've been doing on types for Ruby. 
Uh, and I have to warn you that that little logo is the only picture I have in my talk. Sorry, it's, uh, that's not very exciting. Um, so this is, uh, this is a tool that I built that you can, try, you can actually try it out. Those are the coordinates. Uh, it's called RDL. Please do not ask me what that stands for because I don't know. Um, and it gives you, uh, if you want, optional static type checking for Ruby. So this is not what Matt was talking about. He was talking about inference. This is checking, requires annotations, and the moral, the, the, the rule is you get what you pay for. So if you want to write stuff down in your program, you can check it. If you don't want to write stuff down, fine. There's no cost for that. Also uses some, it also does something called contracts, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Uh, and I have to warn you, this is a prototype, uh, so it hasn't been fire tested, uh, but it does kind of work. Uh, so if you have comments, send feedback. So I'm going to try a live demo now, right? Okay, so please wish me luck here. We're going to see how this goes. All right, so here's a program. This is a fantastic program I wrote. Okay, so I wrote a method called the answer. Returns 42, right? And I could write a test case for this program, but if I want to use RDL, I could also write a type for it. So here's how you do that with RDL. So you require the RDL gem. Let's see if I can type, require RDL. And then you say type. Uh, this takes nothing and gives you back an integer. And I want to type check this uh, right now after it's defined. And uh, notice I actually made a mistake in the program. Uh, actually, I was supposed to return an integer, not a string. And when I run this with RDL, I don't know if the font is big enough. I think I'm going to have to make it bigger. Uh, when I run it, uh, you get a type error that says, uh, got type string, will return type integer as expected. Yay. Type checking demos are kind of boring. Sorry. Uh, all right. So uh, obviously, type checking one line program is not very interesting. Uh, it gets, uh, I could write a test case for this trivially, but maybe it gets more interesting if, say, I take an argument x, and then depending on x, I either return some value or I return 42. So now I have to write two test cases for this, but I only have to write down one type, and it will check both paths. Uh, ah. All right. See, live demo. It's very risky. All right. So I have to write down a, um, uh, so I only have to write down run type, and I still get a type error uh, that I got a string where integer was expected. So that was pretty good. And uh, it's even better if you have your code in the middle of, say, uh, maybe an error case, where it can be really hard to trigger that, right? So obviously that's not going to trigger an error, but maybe there's something complicated here, uh, and it's really hard to figure out how to get that to raise an exception to trigger the error case. So maybe types are good there. Uh, now, of course, you don't just want to type check stuff like this. You might want to like call methods because that could be useful, right? So here's uh, here's a method. I'm returning three plus four, and uh, if you try this with RDL, uh, it complains. Uh, well, that's a long complaint. Uh, it complains. It doesn't have a type for fixed num plus, right? So if that's your own code that you wrote, uh, you have to write down a type for it. That's what you have to pay for. But if it's part of the standard library. You can actually get that if you're lucky enough that I actually wrote it down before, which I did for this. So if you include type slash core, uh, then you can type check this program and it works fine, right? And uh, these types are actually lying around and you can ask about them. So you can say, what's the type of fixed num plus? Uh, like that. There's a little command line tool and it tells you, well, plus has uh, all those different uh, possible types. Uh, you can ask for all the types that are part of uh, fixed num. There are a bu bunch of them. Uh, you can ask, uh, I don't know why you'd want to, but you can ask for every method uh, that takes a fixed num and returns a fixed num. There they are, at least those are the ones I wrote down. And you can even ask for everything that takes anything and gives you a fixed num if you're really desperate for a fixed num and can't think of one, <laughs> right? All right, so, uh, so there's a lot more to say about that. That was really quick, uh, so check it out. Uh, this is a prototype, I need lots of feedback, uh, but I think it's kind of cool, kind of fun. Let me know what you think. Thank you.